we are 7.2 billion people living on the earth today. And we are expected to be 8 billion people in 2024 and to reach the mark of 9 billion people in 2040 with 80% of this population living in big urban centers. So that means that in approximately 30 years, we need to feed an extra 2 billion people. And that's going to be especially hard if you consider that. We live in a world with limited amount of land. Our resources for food production are getting more and more scarce every day, like water and nutrients. And environmental changes are constantly putting in risk agricultural production. For all these reasons, food production is now being pushed to indoor facilities. That's a picture I got from Google after typing indoor farms two months ago. As you can see here, about 90% of these images are real indoor farms, and 10% of these images are conceptual drawings and designs. If you had made, made the same search about two years ago, indoor farms, you would see the opposite. It would be about 90% conceptual drawings talking about indoor farm, the food production method of the future, and maybe 10% of real indoor farms. The reason for that is there is a real demand. So these indoor farms are today a reality. So what are they? Indoor farms are plant factories in which crops are grown in controlled environmental conditions under artificial lighting. They normally rely on hydroponic methods of food production, which uses 90% less water than conventional farm. They do not need the use of pesticides and herbicides. And they can be located in no arable land inside the big urban centers, which then reduces the costs of food transportation, storage, and handling. And what is better? Because these indoor farms, everything is controlled for food production, it can produce up to 100 times more than traditional farm on the same space. However, there is one big problem with these systems. They consume a tremendous amount of energy. Light, which is the most important and the most energy consuming factor for plant growth, is the least controlled factor in these indoor farms. All the other factors are fine tuned controlled for plant growth. For example, water, CO2, nutrients, temperature. For all these factors, there are feedback systems that are monitoring how they're being going on with the plants, and they change as soon as something goes wrong. But lights are still being controlled by a technology invented in 1884 by John Holmes, which is the light switch. So we are basically using a 100 years old technology to control the most important factor in indoor farms. To understand the size of this problem, we have to understand a little bit between the relationship of plants and lights. As everybody here knows, plants are photosynthetic organisms that rely on light energy to photosynthesize. They convert water and CO2 into sugars and oxygen, and they grow. They make their own food. That's amazing. And different from us, plants cannot just stand up and walk away if the environment around them is not favorable. For example, if light is not at optimum conditions for photosynthesis. For this reason, plants have developed several biological feedback systems that allow them to adapt to the environment around them and be able to survive. One of these feedback systems is named xanthophyll cycle. And the xanthophyll cycle is responsible for controlling how efficiently plants can deal with light energy. It allows the plants to be very efficient when there is no much light available and protects the plants against the excess of light when there is too much light available. For example, in a rainy or a cloudy day, like yesterday here in Atlanta, plants must be able to collect the maximum amount of energy as they can and direct all this energy to the photosynthetic process to be able to produce the compounds they need to keep alive and to grow. However, in a bright sunny day, for example today, that might be too much light for the plants. The plants cannot process this energy fast enough. So what happens is all this energy starts to build up, build up on the plants, and then it starts to induce the production of photodamaging compounds. These photodamaging compounds will react with some parts of the leaf and cause damage to them. And if that's too severe, can even kill the plants. So that's when the xanthophyll cycle kicks in. 
The xenophil cycle causes a conformational change on some of the plant's pigments that are responsible for absorbing the light energy and make them waste part of this energy instead of transferring everything to the photosynthetic process. So that's a paradoxical situation in which plant growth and energy waste are both induced by light energy. So it's basically that more energy you give to the plant, more the plant gonna grow, but a big proportion of this light energy will be wasted by the plants. And if you think about that, that makes sense for plants that evolved for millions and millions of years under the abundance of the sunlight. If there is too much light, just waste, no big deal, it's free, right? Now, what if we are growing plants in indoor facilities and paying for the energy that we're providing to the plants? Now we have a big problem, right? And that's exactly what is going on in indoor farms today. So what happens is, the lights are turning on. There is no control at all on the lights, and big part of these lights are just wasted. Something like this, with this analogy, but with lights. Instead of water, we are talking about light energy, and instead of a sink, we are talking about the plant. So I just provide more energy that the plant can handle, and then part of this energy is wasted, but we can't see because it's lights. Up to 80% of the energy that is provided to the plants can be wasted by themselves through these physiological mechanisms. So we need to find a solution for that. <clears throat> we need to, to find a solution for that. We have to understand how the plants are using the lights, and we have to hack the plant's protective systems. We need to be able to push the maximum amount of energy as we can into the plants without activating the xenophil cycle that wastes all this energy and making sure we are not damaging the plants. And this solution should be very flexible because it needs to adapt to different kinds of plants. So different plants have different light requirements. A head of lettuce needs a different amount of light than a plant of tomato. And it is more in interesting that two plants of the same species Two heads of lettuce might need different amounts of light. So what happens is, is, if one of these two plants has any kind of deficiency, maybe low levels of nutrients, or maybe there is not enough water, all these chains around them affect how efficient they can deal with the light, and might cause them to waste more light than a normal plant. So we have to find a solution for that. And my idea is, if we are now growing plants, in indoor facilities, why not make a light system that adapts to the plants instead of having the plants adapting to the lights? So something like that. In a system like this, what would we need? First, a plant sensor that can measure how the plants are using the lights. Second, a control system that is able to make decisions on how to change the lights. And the last part, the lights itself. So by having these three factors in place, we are talking here about of the definition of a biological feedback system that can monitor how the plants are using the light and change based on the plant's real needs. And I'm gonna show you how a system like this looks like. So we have developed at the University of Georgia the first light controlled by a plant in the world. So for the first time, the plants are in control of their own lights. Our plant sensor is a chlorophyll fluorometer. So by measuring plants' fluorescence, we can make assumptions on how the light's been used by the plants. If the light's been used to photosynthesize and produce good things, or if the light's been wasted. Then we have a control software, which is a bunch of electronics that are responsible for receiving the signal from the plant sensor, identifying the signal, and then make a decision on how to change the lights to fit the plant's needs. And of course, we need lights. We are using LED lights for two reasons. First one, LED lights are more efficient than traditional light bulbs, and I think everybody here knows about that. And the second and most important reason is that the LED lights offer a much higher level of controllability than traditional light bulbs. So I'm gonna show you now this system in operation. So what we did, we, plants, we placed a plant of sweet potato inside of this growth chamber, and we set up a photosynthetic target for this plant to work at its maximum capacity. So let's see what happened. Pay attention here, that's the sensor. So it collects, it makes a measurement, 
it identifies that the lights are off and turn on the light. So what's going on now? It keeps reading how the plants are using the light. Here you're going to make another measurement. There you go. Takes a time to identify what is going on. And the light intensity change. So the system is constantly monitoring how the plants are using the light, reading the signal, and then telling the lights to change and adapt to the certain light requirements this plant needs. Change again, the lighting taste. So that's our growth chamber at the University of Georgia. There you go, one more. Perfect. So here is what's going on really with the lights. That's how we are adapting the lights to the plant needs. Like I told you before, LED lights offer a much higher level of controllability than traditional light bulbs. With light bulbs, what you can do, you can, you can turn the lights on, you leave it on for how long you need, and then you turn off the light switch that I show first. But with LED lights, we can control two things. First one, the light frequency, which is how many times the lights turn on and off. So the lights were flashing on this video that we saw. That's light frequency. They were flashing a thousand times per second. We couldn't see that. Our eyes cannot see, but the plants can feel. And that's really important because by flashing the lights, we are giving time for the plants to receive some energy, process this energy, and be ready to get more light energy. The second factor we were controlling was the duty cycle. The duty cycle is how long the lights are on and off. So the lights can be on for a longer time and then turn off for a brief moment. That happens during these thousand pulses that we are giving to the plants. So by leaving the lights on for a longer time than off, we are providing to the plants higher amounts of light. So it's a higher light intensity. And for us, we can perceive that as a brighter light. Or we can do the opposite. We can give longer times of darkness and a brief moment of light and by doing that, we're reducing the amount of light we're providing to the plants, and we can perceive this as a less intense light, low, uh, less brighter light. So by combining these two factors, frequency and duty cycle, we are matching each individual plant requirement. So think about the analogy I made at the beginning with the sink and the water. What we're doing here, we're open and closing really fast the faucet, so, but with lights. So we're providing lights at a certain amounts and rates that we can keep the plant full of energy, which would be the sink full of water, but not giving more than it can handle. So we are not wasting, it's not overflowing. Let's see another video now. It's the same setup, the same thing, the same photosynthetic rate, but now we have a different plant. It's a plant of photos, which requires less light intensity than the first plant that I show, than the sweet potato. So again, it makes a measurement. You see that the plant's not photosynthesizing. There is no lights. And after some time, it turns the lights on. The plant needs a little bit of time. Every time we change the light intensity, there is some time required for the plant to adapt to this new light intensity, up or down regulate the xanthophyll cycle and how it's using the light energy. So that's why we have this space between measurements. So again here, if we take a look the tip of our barometer makes another measurement. It changes the lighting things. There you go. So that will go on. Those are the results of this experiment. So by having the plants controlling their own lights through this biological feedback system, what happens is that the plant of photos, which requires low light levels, adjust its own light to 12% of its maximum capacity of the light system. The plant of sweet potato adjusts the light intensity to 64% of the maximum capacity of the lighting system. And the last picture is a situation that growers have today, where they just turn on, the light comes on full power, or they turn off. So what that means is, if growers were using today this biological feedback system, they would be saving 80-80% of energy if they were growing a plant of photos. If they were growing sweet potato, they would be saving 64% of its energy consumption compared to the situation with no light control. So what we're doing here, 
we are never converting electricity into light that will be later be dissipated by the plants. So that represents the potential benefits these systems can, grow, can bring to indoor growers today. It's an autonomous system that can adapt to any kind of different plant. It can be used in lettuce, it can be used in tomato, in microgreens, in pepper, all kinds of plants. And it's a very dynamic system that is constantly monitoring how the plants are using the light and is constantly changing based on the plant's real needs. What that means is it provides the maximum amount of energy saving to the growers along the entire cycle of the plant grow. So that offers today a real solution for indoor farms and it can help to expand the barriers of food production. By further developing this technology, our intention is to reduce the operational costs of indoor farms and increase the production of high quality crops to meet a constantly increasing world demands for food. Thank you.